Egyptian civilization was not the product of Stone Age sub-Saharan hunter-gatherers or foragers. It emerged from complex cultural and technological developments regionally rooted in North Africa and the Levant, driven by agricultural innovation, long-range trade, and early state formation. Genetic findings from the Nuerat study clearly establishes the individual's ancestry as approximately 80% Middle Neolithic Moroccan and 20% Neolithic Mesopotamian. This data directly contradicts Afrocentrism's central claim of sub-Saharan origins. Both QPADM and admixture modeling in the Nuerat study unequivocally exclude sub-Saharan ancestry, most notably any genetic affinity with the 4,500-year-old Ethiopian motor specimen, as well as with central, eastern, or southern sub-Saharan African populations. The data show absolutely no contribution from these groups to the Nuerat individual. When NUE001, the Old Kingdom individual, was projected against modern Eurasians, North Africans, Sub-Saharan Africans and East Africans, including 68 ancient Sub-Saharan and East African genomes, the results were definitive. The individual clustered consistently with Caucasoid populations. Notice how those in the main who promote Afrocentrism, mostly Bantu descended, lie at the extreme opposite end of the genetic spectrum, completely distant and unrelated. Oh, the irony. Another point of interest, even the oldest known sub-Saharan sample, dating back 22,000 years, shows no genetic affinity with any non-African populations. This underscores a deep and persistent population structure between sub-Saharan Africa and the regions that contributed to the ancestry of ancient Egyptians, including North Africa and the Levant. The genetic and geographic divide is clear, long-standing, and scientifically well-documented. East Africans are not genetic isolates, they carry substantial Eurasian admixture, the result of multiple migration events into the Horn and surrounding regions over thousands of years. Their East African component further distinguishes them from ancient Nile Valley populations like those of the Old Kingdom, who cluster more closely with North Africans and Levantines. Sub-Saharan populations fall entirely outside the genetic clustering of ancient Egyptian samples and Eurasians as a whole. They don't just diverge, they fall off the chart. The Nuerat individual clusters most closely with the abuser mummies from the late period, demonstrating over 2,000 years of genetic continuity within ancient Egypt. Furthermore, the data show over 4,000 years of continuity between the Nuerat sample and present-day Egyptians, reinforcing the view that the core ancestry of Egypt has remained remarkably stable from the Old Kingdom through to the modern population. The long-standing Afrocentric claim that ancient Egyptians came from the south is thoroughly and definitively dismissed by the genetic evidence. The data, spanning genome-wide analysis, QPADM modeling, and population clustering, show no ancestral link between the Old Kingdom individual and any ancient or modern sub-Saharan African population. This narrative collapses under the weight of hard science. Similarly, the simplistic claim that Egypt is in Africa, and therefore black, is a reductionist view that collapses under even elementary scrutiny both academically and logically. Geography alone does not dictate population ancestry, especially in the ancient world, where migrations, trade and cultural exchange were constant forces shaping civilizations. The location of Egypt at the crossroads of Africa and the Near East functioned as a cultural and genetic interchange, not an extension of an isolated outpost as such is Sub-Sahara. Neolithic populations in Egypt and Nubia shared clear regional ancestry with groups from North Africa and West Asia. Due to its geographic proximity, Egypt was among the first regions external to the Fertile Crescent, to usher in the Neolithic package, originating in West Asia as early as the 6th millennium BCE, 
through processes that unquestionably involved population movement, not merely cultural diffusion. This demographic shift is further supported by bioarchaeological data. Around 6000 BCE, significant morphometric shifts in cranial structure, dental morphology, and odontometric proportions appear in Nubian skeletal remains, indicating a clear biological discontinuity with the preceding Mesolithic populations of Sudan. Ignored is the fact that Neolithic Egypt shares no biological affinity to Mesolithic Sudanese populations and vice versa. Moreover, Mesolithic Sudanese groups themselves display no continuity or very little, if any, with Neolithic Sudan, reflecting a significant population shift driven by incoming Eurasian-related groups. As biological anthropologist J.D. Irish notes in his paper, the transition from hunting gathering to agriculture in Nubia, early Mesolithic populations in Sudan were not indigenous to the region, but instead exhibited affinities to sub-Saharan African groups. This underscores that the Nile Valley experienced waves of migration and replacement and that its population history cannot be reduced to simplistic linear narratives based on geography alone. Becker notes early Sudanese populations belong to the saharo nilotic population complex, that they were biologically sub-Saharan in origin and therefore did not share ancestry with North African groups. Notably, A-group Nubians were not part of this saharo nilotic complex, highlighting a clear biological and demographic distinction between them and earlier sub-Saharan associated populations in the region. Dental traits from the Arizona State University Dental Anthropology System, otherwise known as ASUDAS, is widely used in anthropological and forensic research to assess biogeographical origins and genetic affinities of individuals and populations. Fifteen dental traits, when selected from the standardized ASUDAS system, is sufficient to determine population affinity with a high degree of reliability, particularly when used in comparative studies across well-documented reference populations. A 2020 paper by Rathman et al. states that the highest accuracy in determining population affinity is achieved when using targeted combinations of highly diagnostic ASUDAS traits, rather than relying on the full suite. Selective trait analysis enhances resolution by focusing on features with the greatest interpopulation variability and lowest rates of homoplasy. The cranial morphology of the NUE individual provides clear evidence of Eurasian affinities, aligning closely with West Eurasian and North African populations rather than with sub-Saharan groups. This supports the broader genomic findings indicating Eurasian-derived ancestry in Old Kingdom Egypt. Using 29 cranial metric variables rather than 13 significantly improves accuracy and resolution of ancestry estimation. The expanded set captures a broader and more nuanced range of cranial morphology, increasing statistical power, reducing classification error, and allowing for more meaningful comparisons across diverse populations. It's important to note that the use of 29 cranial metrics in the analysis of the NUE individual yielded close affinities with West Asian populations, offering a high resolution and statistically robust result. In contrast, Cater's reliance on only 13 cranial variables significantly limits discriminatory power and leads to less reliable conclusions. This methodological difference likely accounts for the divergence in findings, underscoring how reduced datasets can distort population affinity assessments. Cater's ruse has been exposed. The selective use of limited data, outdated methods and interpretive bias can no longer stand against the weight of modern, high-resolution analyses conducted by multiple anthropologists and geneticists. The evidence, both morphological and genetic, speaks for itself, and it points in a direction far removed from the narratives Afrocentrism has tried to manufacture.
This is a lateral view of the Nuarat skull contrasted directly with a sub-Saharan example, specifically one presented by King Monologue as typically African. His definition relies exclusively on traits associated only with sub-Saharans and therefore is a selectively narrow classification that deliberately excludes both North African and East African cranial variation. Selective framing skews the comparison from the outset and fails to account for the full spectrum of cranial variation across the entire continent. This side-by-side -side comparison makes it unmistakably clear why the Nuarat individual clusters with West Eurasians rather than sub-Saharans. The morphology exhibited in the remains is consistent with what biological anthropologists classify as Caucasoid. This isn't a subjective interpretation. It reflects the convergence of evidence from genetics, bioanthropology, and archaeology. At this point, the narrative has collapsed. At this stage, it's no longer a debate. It's ideology clashing with established science. Note the stark contrasts. The skull that King Monologue presents as typically African lacks key features commonly found in ancient Egyptian crania, such as, for example, rocker jaw, which is clearly absent in his example. Even more striking is the pronounced bimaxillary prognathism in the sub-Saharan example, which stands in clear contrast to the relatively orthognathic profile observed in Egyptian specimens like Nuarat. These differences are not subtle, they are anatomically and diagnostically significant. How do Afrocentrics explain these discrepancies? They don't. They either ignore it or reframe the discussion to avoid directly confronting the evidence. Can you spot the Egyptian? Apparently, even this basic exercise has become a major challenge for Afrocentric narratives, especially when the actual evidence doesn't align with their assumptions. The Old Kingdom Nuarat individual exhibited a skin tone typical of North African and West Asian populations, not the deep, melanated phenotype commonly associated with sub-Saharas. This aligns with the consistent visual representations found in Egyptian art, where figures are depicted with a dark reddish hue. Contrary to Afrocentric claims, the data do not support a sub-Saharan or black phenotype, but rather one consistent with indigenous North African populations. While the DNA data was sufficient to determine genetic ancestral origin or genetic affinity, it did not provide information about pigmentation traits, such as skin, eye, or hair color. As a result, the facial reconstruction was deliberately shown in black and white and without speculative features like hair or facial hair to avoid misrepresentation. If Afrocentrics are mad, it's not hard to see why. The genetic profile of the Nuarat individual consists of approximately 80% North African and 20% Mesopotamian ancestry. Both components are also present in the third intermediate period abuser population, suggesting a pattern of genetic continuity and sustained gene flow. Notably, the Mesopotamian component appears more pronounced in the abusier individuals, likely reflecting increased influence from Bronze Age migrations into Egypt. Crucially, these later samples retain the core Nuarat genetic signature, further reinforcing their ancestral link to Old Kingdom populations. All claims popularized by figures such as Diop, Van Sertima, Cater, the so-called Dr. Ben and others are contradicted by a growing body of genetic, archaeological and bioanthropological evidence. As more research emerges, it's clear that much of what was once projected as fact by these feel-good con artists lacks scientific support, forcing a re-evaluation of such long-held ideological, albeit racist, narratives. And there you have it, no sub-Saharan origin for ancient Egyptians, temporally or spatially. Abu Sir is all smiles.
What's particularly telling is the silence from the Afrocentric camp regarding the recently published results on a Neolithic population from central Sudan. Despite being deep in the African continent, this population carried exclusively Eurasian mitochondrial haplogroups. Not a single East African lineage was present. That's right, the latest Mesolithic sites in this area of Sudan date to the second half of the 6th millennium BC. By the very beginning of the 5th millennium BC and possibly earlier, we witness the introduction of a new culture equipped with the full Neolithic package. The new incoming culture effectively replaces the local Mesolithic one, which explains the Eurasian genetic profile observed among Gaba's inhabitants. What's particularly striking is how this culture appears suddenly and fully developed in central Sudan during this period. And yet there's no outcry, no debate, no scrutiny by the Afrocentrics. Why? Perhaps because it isn't Egypt, so it doesn't serve the Afrocentric narrative or deserve the attention. The story of Neolithic Gaba deserves a deeper discussion and we'll return to it in due time.